<clears throat> she do the sharpie. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna leave that with you. <laughs> well, don't complain if my voice sounds better than yours. Hello and welcome to Nostalgia's Perspective, a podcast where two friends look back on the media which has influenced us. I'm Jay. And I'm Georgia. And this week we are going to be looking at Every Day by David Levithan. Levithan, yeah. So, Jay, this was your choice. Uh, so, why'd you pick it? So, this was, for a long time, my favourite book. Obviously, last week we did last episode... We did Jane Eyre, which is now your favourite book. This was my favourite book for a long time, so I read it... um, It would have been when I was about 19, 18, 19, probably? 17, 18, 19, that sort of time. And that was also the sort of time when I was coming to terms with my sexuality. And about to come out or having just come out I'm not sure which I came out at 18 and it was a very important book to me for that reason like the representation in this book was something that struck a chord with me right away and there's other reasons that I enjoyed it which I'm sure we'll talk about but yeah it just really hooked me at that time and so it was my favourite book for a long time to the extent that in our last year of uni in one of my modules, I wrote a script or the beginning of a script adaptation for it. Yeah, so that's why I that's why I picked it. And we met him, didn't we? We yeah, 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 we did. Yeah, yeah, it was at Bath Children's Literature Festival. He... How did you find that? <laughs> um, it's the one time I've met a famous person I think and it was my favourite author and I was very awkward (laughs) (laughs) which I'm sure you can attest to to be honest with you I had to write an article about it and so I was so focused on making notes for that article that you could have like (laughs) taken off your top and done a dance and I probably wouldn't have noticed (laughs) I mean I hate to criticise but that doesn't seem like great journalism if you wouldn't have noticed that. It wasn't my best article. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. But yeah, no, it was It was still great to hear him talk and everything. It's just very daunting meeting your favourite author. Yeah. And so it was just quite awkward. Also awkward because it was actually a joint talk with him and Rachel Cohn, I believe, is how her name was pronounced, mm. which neither of us had read any of her books. No. Which made it a bit awkward when we stood in the line to have our book signed, and they were both sat at the table, and it was laid out that you go to her first, and then you go to him, and we just had to be like, yeah, sorry, we just have his books. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sure, you're <laughs> that great, was but, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was and then we didn't really know what to do because uh he was talking to someone and signing their books at the time. And so we couldn't go on to him, but also we didn't have any reason to be stood by her, but we just kind of stood there with her and I think you asked her how she was finding Bath and so it was just very awkward. <laughs> I mean, at least you had read his book. At that point, I had re- read neither of their books. Yes, but you still had his book in your hand for him to sign. <laughs> so... What what did I do? Did I... I think I got him to sign the book that he did with John Green, didn't I? Yeah, you had Will Grayson, Will Grayson. Which I still haven't read. Anyway. Anyway... <laughs> So what are we discussing today with Every Day? 
So, firstly, I'll ask, because obviously you hadn't read it before, so Mm -hmm. it feels right to just ask, just generally, what you thought of it. I liked... I like the concept, and we'll discuss this, I'm sure we'll discuss this later, but I liked the idea of seeing all of these different perspectives. Yeah. And I liked the way that you saw so many different people. I don't know. It was, it was overall, I read it in, you know, quite a short space of time. Yeah. Finishing it off this morning. (laughs) Um, And... One of the things that I found with reading YA book, well, we were having this discussion before we started recording about how teenage years feel both like they were recent yeah. and also far away. Yeah. And when I read YA books, I'm, I can be quite critical of them because I can think, oh, you're being quite juvenile. But on the other hand, it's quite nice to get yourself into the mindset of somebody who hasn't who isn't an adult yet yeah does that make sense yeah it is very interesting reading YA fiction as an adult because I think when I was in my late teens and early 20s I felt like I was reading YA fiction as an adult and still experiencing it in the same way as when I was a teenager reading it And I thought it would be like that throughout my adulthood. But reading it now that I'm 24, it does feel very different. Yeah. It feels like I'm reading a life that I'm not part of anymore. Maybe it's because, like, late teens, early 20s, we were still in uni, we were still in education. We were still experiencing a lot of the same things that you do at, like, 16. Mm. But now you... Once you're in your mid-twenties, you're living a completely different life. Yeah. And so it really does feel like, oh, this is someone completely different. This is a completely different time in this person's life. And it's also some of the ways in which A acts in the book, I'm much more critical of now than I would have been when I read it initially. Because yeah. it feels like, oh, why are you doing that? And obviously the reason why is because they're a teenager. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's very interesting reading YA now with a completely different perspective. Because it has actually been a little while since I've read any YA. Mm. It's been a good year since I've read any YA. Yeah, I think the last YA book I read was... Oh, do you know what? I don't know why I said that before I thought about which YA book I read last. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's been a couple of years. Yeah? Yeah, A was where I struggled with. They were one of those characters that I understood and yet got irritated with a lot of the time. Yeah. I liked Rhiannon and the ending I got annoyed at right okay (laughs) but more from a writer's perspective than like criticizing it does that make sense sure how do you mean explain that a bit more okay so one thing i was very curious about was it felt as though i struggled to think of how it was going to end right i was like either you know something miraculous happens Or I'm struggling to envision how this is all going to play out. Yeah. It felt like the plot with the Reverend and Nathan just suddenly ended. Right. And then A decides that Rhiannon should be with Alexander. And then, maybe it's just because I've read it once and I read it quite quickly that I'm just... That I'm a bit... The last bit. A wakes up as Katie and says that they need to run away. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a bit unclear to me. When they say they need to run away, do they need to run away because of the reverend? Or do they need to run away because they've decided they're going to live as Katie forever? No, kind of neither. They essentially run away because they just need to 
get away from it and start afresh. And also they now know that there's other people out there like them. Mm. And so kind of want to find out a bit more about that. Okay, yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it ended quite suddenly. Yeah. I think that is definitely a criticism you could level at it in that the Reverend and Nathan storyline kind of plays along in the background. You're not really paying much attention to it. And then suddenly it's like a we're very much confronted with something that we didn't expect at all. And then yeah. it does kind of go away because we have to wrap up the Rhiannon story. Yeah. But I think I just kind of overlook that because I like the whole... I like the book as a whole. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny now that, like, last week you discussed how you didn't like the ending of Jane Eyre. And right. now I'm saying that I didn't like the ending of Every Day. Um, but that both of us liked the books because we liked them as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, well, how would you feel if I told you that there were two more books following this one? The first one being the same story, but from Rhiannon's perspective. And then there's a third book, which is events that take place after the events of this book. I don't know. Yeah? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So the one from Rhiannon's perspective is called Another Day, and then the book after is called Someday. Hmm. See, I'm not sure I'd be interested in the one from Rhiannon's perspective. Right. Because that would just feel like I'm reading the same. I've never really held much for books that are just told from a different perspective. Just yeah. because I'm like, isn't this just the same story over again, but you've chosen the perspective that you decided wasn't worth writing about? Or maybe <laughs> that's just me being cynical. <laughs> um, and, but I didn't know there was a sequel. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there wasn't when we saw him speak. Okay. Another day was out, but some day still wasn't out. Is it worth the read? I really enjoyed Another Day. I think Another Day is definitely worth the read. Some day disappointed me. I think partly because of built up expectations, partly because I was older when I read it, probably made a difference as well. Yeah. And this is a very unique book, and I think it lost some of that possibly. Yeah. To be honest, I couldn't tell you exactly what happens in some day. Okay. It didn't leave a lasting impression, I think is all I could say of it. How about the movie? How did the movie do? Oh, I watched the first five, ten minutes and stopped. <laughs> Were you like, this isn't like the how I wrote the screenplay for university? I mean, yeah, I did so much better. <laughs> I did so much better. No. Mine was much more faithful. But... No, I just didn't like it. It's also one of those things where I judged it a little bit before I started watching it. Yeah. So obviously when you read a book and you love it and you have a mental image of the people in the book as well, it was one of those situations as well. Because the thing that really trips me up before I even start watching the film when I just see the poster is that for some reason, when I read the book... Rhiannon was black. I don't know why, and when you read the book kind of with that in mind to almost check, like, oh, why did I think that? It seems like she's more likely white. But no, she was she was black to me when I read it, and so obviously it's a white actress in the film. Also, I think the film does it more from her perspective, which as much as I enjoy every day as a sorry, as much as I enjoy another day, which is the book from her perspective, that's not what I want. But this is all from the first 10 minutes and the poster. So <laughs> I can't really judge it. So the first specific topic I had down to talk about was representation in this book and kind of two avenues to that discussion. So firstly, LGBT representation in this book, which is one of the reasons why it uh, hit me and became my favourite book. And then also just general diversity of narrative, which mm. is something that you've actually touched upon already. Yeah, it was... I don't know. Some, it was it was difficult. It, it got a lot into it, you know? Like, I was surprised by how many different 
because of the nature of A yeah. and the switching bodies every day, like it shouldn't surprise me how many different issues it dealt with, but it did deal with a lot of different issues. Yeah. Some of them I think were done well. Yeah. Some of them I'm not too sure about. Right, okay. And it's just because of the nature of the book. Because yeah. the nature of the book is that like each day is told quite briefly. Yeah. Some of the issues I was like, okay, that was quite a deep issue to only spend like a couple of pages on. Yeah, and also because the narrative is A and Rhiannon's relationship a lot of the time as well, some things have to be shrugged off a little bit and just briefly touched upon rather than properly dived into. Yeah. But I found... I did find it refreshing reading from the perspective of somebody who doesn't conform to either gender. Yes. And I found it interesting looking at the dynamics of A's and Rhiannon's relationship in the sense that she is clearly straight. Yeah. And on the one hand, I... I do understand that she, like, there was a line at one point where A notes that when they are in the body of a female, yeah. Rhiannon isn't particularly, like, affectionate. Yeah. And I simultaneously understood Rhiannon's perspective and also did feel sorry for A because, you know, they're genderless. Like, it makes no difference to them whether they're yeah. male or female. Yeah. Like, or in the body of a male or female. Yeah. And so I imagine it would be difficult to present as one gender and then have somebody who you're in love with be really affectionate towards you yeah. and then be a different gender the next day and then suddenly they are not physically attracted towards you. Yeah. You know? It made me see a point of view that I'd... You know, as somebody who's cisgendered... Yeah. I did find it interesting to be... Well, to read from the perspective of somebody who doesn't conform to either gender. Yeah, I think, firstly, two things I'll kind of say. The first thing is, I read this book trying to determine a lot more how A would identify were they not someone who switched bodies every day. And I think gender fluid is probably the best label if you want to put a label on them. Yeah. Because at one point they say that when they were younger, there were days when they woke up in the body of a boy and felt more like a girl, and days when they woke up in the body of a girl and felt more like a boy. So that seems to be that it depends on the day. Yeah. The second thing I'll say is it would be interesting to hear a perspective which... I've not done any research for the podcast, unfortunately, so I'm sure it's probably out there. But it would be interesting to know a perspective, a gender fluid or a non-binary or non-conforming perspective on this book and how well that is represented in here. Yeah. Because definitely that's something that I always loved about this book, is seeing that perspective. But I can definitely see ways that this book is a little bit dated. Yeah. Yeah. And so it would be interesting to hear specifically a uh, gender fluid, gender non-binary perspective on A's characterization. Yeah. It has made me want to research and see if there's any books that I'm interested in that are from. Because I think that the issue with counting this as a non-binary perspective is the fact that because of the because of the device and the nature of the fact that the reason well I don't want to go about and say that the reason that A is gender fluid is yeah. because they switch bodies, but because that's the plot device, yeah, it's not really from the perspective of somebody who's gender fluid or um non binary, but it's from the perspective of somebody who switches bodies every day. Yeah, I think it's actually almost Weirdly enough, the easiest gender to assign to A was a, a gender fluid um, identity because were they either male or female, it would be, I mean, quite simply, it would be horrific for them. Yeah. <laughs> because they'd be waking up in the in the wrong gendered body half the time. So it's actually very convenient 
for the character to be gender fluid. Yeah. Again, this is a thing where you almost have to take it at face value to an extent, the Mm. representation, because if you think about it too much, it falls apart a little bit. Yeah. But other than that, it was refreshing to have a... I don't know. Because the first chapter opens with a pretty much immediately being besotted with Rhiannon. Yeah. You know, all past relationships or all feelings towards other people are kind of told through the lens of, well, now I'm in love with Rhiannon. Right. But it was also nice to read about a protagonist who has been in love with both guys and girls before. And I don't know. I think I read a lot of classics. Right. And generally classics don't have that perspective. (laughs) Yeah, not great for representation, typically classics. No, they are not. Um, And so, yeah, it was, you know, it was nice to delve into that a bit more. I want to talk more about the LGBT side of it, but do we want to talk a bit more first about the way the nature of A's character and the nature of the narrative allows us to have our protagonists wake up in a different body each day and see a different perspective. Do we want to talk about that a little bit more? So the fact that obviously A wakes up in the body of people of different races and different social situations. So there's one point where he wakes up in the body of a woman who we assume is, or a girl, who we assume is an immigrant worker who barely speaks English, which I think is actually one which is a little bit rushed. Yeah, like that's... Like saying earlier. That was the one that really yeah. came to mind about yeah. being rushed. Yeah, I wonder if that is one that wouldn't be so rushed nowadays, because I think issues of immigration have come up a lot more to the public consciousness since 2012 when it was written. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's one of those... I'm sure we'll discuss this as we talk more about the writing. But I think that we're told often as writers, write what you know. Right, yeah. And I think that the reason we're often told, write what you know, is because we are able to dive quite deep into those topics with a lot of knowledge. Yeah. And I'm right in thinking that David Leverton is gay, right? Yeah, he is a gay cisgendered man. Yeah. White and so man. I think that one of the reasons that the LGBT representation, uh, representation works really well, and I really liked the chapter where they, um, where A goes with the boyfriend of the body to Pride... Yes. Like those, the LGBT side of it really flourishes, yeah. I think. And then when it gets into, and I, and I'm glad that David Leverton decided not to just limit who A became, yes. because I've read when I was younger, I did funny enough read a YA book about a girl who goes into t- different people's bodies. She My. spends, she spends like a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months with each body, but she's always the body of a white female. Right. Like, and so I'm glad that he didn't limit himself to that. Yeah. But I think that it's just one of the natural downsides. Yeah. Is that the the scenes about LGBT like flourish because that's clearly what he knows. Yeah. While the scenes about different topics seem to be quite rushed because I think that he couldn't delve as deeply into them, just on the basis of, you know, that isn't his life. Yeah, I think he has to be given credit for the amount, like you say, the amount of different perspectives that are in this book. Definitely. And I think considering the amount of different perspectives, he does a bloody good job of doing each of them, or certainly, definitely, most of them, justice. Yeah. The chapter, by the way, with it's Hugo and Austin are the ones That's that go it. to Pride. I loved that. 
<laughs> um, when I first read it, that got me. Yeah. Because God, um, as a as a kid from, uh, as a kid in the middle of nowhere, growing up in the middle of nowhere, to read about a gay teenage couple being out and going to Pride, is like wish fulfillment fiction. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, so I think he should be given great credit for how well he does. And I would like to know your perspective on the mental health chapter, on the depression chapter. Do you know, I was just about to bring that up because it was both my favourite chapter and... I don't know, because this was where I struggled with a as a character because I understood... so. In the chapter, if anybody needs a refresh in, A is in the body of a girl with major depression and suicidal thoughts and she has a plan to commit suicide. And like the other like the other chapters, it was it was effective at being in that perspective and seeing how just simply being the in the body of somebody with depression meant that A's whole mentality was shifting. Yeah. And that they just struggled to get up and go through the day. And, you know, many people have many different perspectives on how depression works. And I'm sure some people would argue, oh, well, depression isn't about that. You know, if you were to switch the mind, then you wouldn't have depression. But David Leverton clearly decided to go with the more biological aspect um, psychology of depression yeah. in yeah. the sense that it's part of their brain chemistry yeah. and that people are ma- naturally more in tune to become depressed yes and i liked the ending of the chapter i liked that i don't know because i sometimes i think that one of a flaw of mine is that i can be quite critical of characters but if you if characters don't make mistakes then there's no conflict. Um, In the sense that when A was like, I don't know what to do, and they call Rhiannon, and they're like, oh, I can't interfere too much. And I was like, interfere? This girl is planning to commit suicide in six days. Like, this isn't a question. Yeah. Um, Yeah, in their defence, they do say, I think at some point, or Rhiannon says, I think they say, in fact, that they knew they had to do something. They just needed to hear it from her. Yeah, I think there is that line. Um, and so, yeah, I, I I, did enjoy the chapter. I, well, enjoy is a bit of a weird word to <laughs> the use. The wrong word, yeah. But... It's the wrong word to use. But I did find that chapter very effective. Um, and had I been reading it as a teenager, I think that that yeah. probably really would have been the chapter that I related to the most yeah definitely um yeah i think personally i think it's a really good representation of depression and a really honest representation and it also makes a point about depression not being the same as sadness and not being something that someone can just think themselves out of the same with addiction later there's a chapter where A wakes up in the body of an addict and they just have to spend that day fighting the addiction. Yeah. And it makes a point about mental health in a way that the plot device lends itself to make in a way that can't really be made in any other... I'm struggling to put this into words, but essentially what I mean is when you have one character waking up in the same body every day, like everyone normally does they would always be biased in their perspective on their own mental health Mm. or on other people's mental health. I think the plot device allows A to make both an experience-based point and an outsider's perspective point at the same time. Yeah, They're able to say, look, I don't feel this every day, but when I'm in this body, it is very clearly something that is affecting me that is out of my control. And I I think that allows... David Leverton to really make a point about these things that look, no, they are, they can't be helped. Yeah. 
And I think that one of the problems when it comes to writing about mental illness is that if you write, I think that when you write about mental illness, you have three, two, maybe three options. The first is that you give it the really hard truth. And the hard truth is that not everybody gets better. And yeah. even those who do get better are battling with something for the entirety of their lives. Yeah. And that makes for a pretty sad book, you know? Yes, especially at this age. Yes. Especially if you're trying to do it at YA. Yes. Second option is that you have a character who is realistically going to struggle to develop in a way that you're not going to get so much of a satisfying free act structure with it because yes. it's not a, just a progression upwards. Yes, and also when you get characters like that, it's very easy to get annoyed with them. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, why aren't you, why aren't you doing this or doing this or whatever? Why aren't you getting better? And yeah. it's an awful perspective to have, but when you're reading it as a, as a piece of fiction... Like you say, because it doesn't fit the typical three-act structure of progression, it can be frustrating as a reader. Yeah. And then the third option is character gets gradually better, 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 and they do follow the three-act structure. But that always feels a bit false. It's yeah. satisfying as a reader, but it's not satisfying in terms of representing mental health accurately. Yeah, it always leaves an empty feeling. <laughs> Yeah. If they're like, oh, that was a nice story. Not realistic, <laughs> but it's nice. Yeah. I find that they are often... You'll have a protagonist with bad mental health issues and then they get better, better, better and then during the climax they'll suddenly dip down and they'll be really bad and then yeah. they'll be perfect again. Yeah. Um, and then there'll be some heartwarming paragraph at the end going, and although life wasn't perfect, it was on the up. Yes. And you're like, okay. Like you say, that was nice. Yeah. Um, not necessarily accurate to anything, but it was yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, and so I think that back to every day. Yeah. I suppose the benefit of the plot device of every day is that you could have those couple of cha chapters with people dealing with serious mental illness. Yeah. And it's simultaneously frustrating as a reader because you're like, I want to know how that's resolved, but yeah. it's realistic in the sense that it's not resolved. Yes. Um, in that you know that she'll have difficulties going forward. Yes. It will be a long struggle. But we also get a slight happy resolution, we think, because it's kind of suggested that she gets some sort of help. Yeah. The other one that stuck out to me was the chapter about Dana, who has been drunk the night before and has crashed the car. And through and can't remember the night before but then remembers that she killed her brother by drink driving yeah and that her parents and her doctor and even a are questioning why she did that to herself again like after such a traumatic event yeah. why she then drank again and then got in a car again yeah. and i found myself feeling very sorry for that for that yeah. girl yeah um and again, realistic in the sense that you don't get answers as to why she put herself in that situation again, um, or how her life turned out after that. Yes. Yeah. I hadn't actually thought too much on that chapter, to be honest. But now that you've said it, I wonder if that was a thing. It almost feels like David Leverton wrote that as being like, he didn't understand quite how someone could do that but understood very much that someone could. Yeah. And that they weren't to blame for it so much. It's it's impossible to say because we aren't in her, in her body for long enough. Yeah. To talk about one more chapter specifically, or one more character that we inhabit, and to pull it back to what we were talking about earlier, a couple of the ways that it doesn't do so great with representation... I think, or certainly to an extent feels dated in representation. I is... wonder if we've, I wonder if you've gotten, like if you're about to say the one that I've got in mind. Vic. 
Oh, I Ooh. I was going to say the one of Finn, the one about the obese guy. Oh, yes. Okay, we can talk about that first if you want. No, we'll talk about Vic first. In honesty, I might have like been by that point I was like, okay, I want to get to the plot again. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that's part of the problem of the chapter of the representation is that in that chapter is that both of the main characters want to get to the plot too. Yeah. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, what that means is that the one time we inhabit a trans character in the novel, we're more focused on the plot than on the the character. Yeah. Which is a shame. Yes. Because I think, and I'm speaking here as a cis person to put that out there be very clear about that but i think some of the trans representation in the book is lacking yeah in a few ways i think like you said earlier david levithan being a gay man gives a lot of strength to the gay narratives however i think in a couple of ways it does it does just fall down on the trans representation Firstly, I want to bring up the point of on the back of the book and at a couple of times in the book, A is referred to as he. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, which rings wrong to me because while there would certainly be gender fluid people, non-binary people who would identify with the pronoun he... I think when you're representing an underrepresented group in fiction, I think it would be better and clearer to use they for A, as we have been doing. Yeah. Because I think it also then... I think using he for A makes this into a straight love story. Yeah. Which I think means that it loses something in that. And I think that's disappointing. I think a lot of people would read this book and imagine A as male. And I think that's disappointing. And I think that the use of he plays into that. Coming back to Vic, because I said I was going to talk about Vic, and then I kind of went off on that as a bit of a tangent. But coming back to Vic, Rhiannon misgenders him? Yeah, I did know that bit of Rhiannon because I didn't know what year it was made. And yeah. I, you know, I said that you said it was 2012. And, you know, before we started recording, I thought it was a bit later than that. But even yeah. at 2012, Rhiannon's like, oh, that's something I can't get my head around, you know, female who's a man. And I was like, Rhiannon, it's like, come on, like, you have surely heard about this before. Like, yeah. I think you'd you know? be surprised. Yeah? I think we've come further in these eight years than we realise. Mm. I certainly think, to argue the other side of it briefly first, then, I think for Rhiannon as a character, I can understand it, and I can be like, oh, Rhiannon, but at the same time be like, I see how this is not something that you've encountered before, and so you don't really know how to deal with it you don't really understand it mm. because i'm sure there are plenty of teenagers who wouldn't understand how to respectfully address a trans person and how to navigate those conversations in sensitive ways yeah to ensure that they were being respectful especially teenagers in 2012 yeah i mean i don't know about you i wouldn't have been great yeah I mean... Like, I d I'm not proud of that, but I know that I wouldn't have been great. No, I probably wouldn't have been great either. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. And hopefully things are better now, at yeah. least a little bit. I mean, there was such a lack of education. Yeah. When, you know, even only 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, there were certainly still not great amounts and still not enough in mainstream media, but there's definitely better trans representation now. Yeah. And even where there's not in media, it's in the zeitgeist, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of talk about it in media, in news media. 
Yeah. At least. So I think people are a lot more aware of it now. Rhiannon nowadays would probably be aware of it at least. Yeah. But yeah, as much as like, like I say, I can understand it from her character's perspective because of that, but she doesn't get called out on it. Yeah. Because of the narrative, because of where A and Rhiannon are in their narrative, they don't call her out on it. And that's just a bit disappointing to me because, yeah. look, you've just misgendered him. A should call her out and they want to call her out, but they don't because of the narrative. But it's unfortunate. I wish that David Leverton hadn't made the character trans in this chapter. <laughs> Yeah. I wish we'd got a chapter where being trans could be explored in the same way that being depressed is explored. Yeah. I also, to kind of touch upon Rhiannon, one thing I did struggle with her character was, okay, I under... I understood from a teenage perspective that she's been with Justin for a year and that she does feel some form of attachment to him. Yeah. But there were points where so there were points where Justin said really inexcusable things. And like okay, the the clearest one that comes to mind is after A is in the body of I've forgotten her name. Ashley? Ashley. Yeah. yeah. After they're in the body of Ashley and so Ashley's a black girl. And they meet Justin and things go awry. Um, Things go pear-shaped and it ends with Justin very angry at Ashley. Rhiannon says the next time that A and Rhiannon meet that the entire way home, Justin was calling Ashley that black bitch. And if I had been Rhiannon and my boyfriend had said that, like... That's a that's a no brainer. Like you are a jerk at like, and that's me being like PC on a podcast. Um, yeah, you know, like I felt there were times where it was like, oh, you know, he said he kept saying that, and I'm like, no, Rhiannon, that's a bit that's a bit of a bigger deal than you're making out, you know? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things to that that I would say. <laughs> Firstly. I think Rhiannon as a character, like with the misgendering of Vic, is a flawed character. Yeah. And she maybe isn't presented as a flawed character as obviously as she should be. And I think, again, that comes down to it being written in 2012 and that we aren't, we weren't as critical of those sorts of things. It kind of comes to the thing that's very much in the consciousness at the moment that being not racist isn't enough. You should be anti-racist. Yeah. And that I think she's not racist, but she's not anti-racist. Yeah. And so I think that's very much a thing of the time. And I think that is a flaw of Rhiannon, but I think it's very believable. Also, I think Rhiannon as a character, you must have known people who wouldn't break up with their boyfriend. Yeah. And relationships which were toxic and which were unhealthy. Like, I think that is something that's very... It's difficult because I've read Another Day as well, and I think that plays into what I know about Rhiannon as a character and Rhiannon and Justin's relationship a little bit, probably. But I think it is very much, even in just this book, presented as a unhealthy relationship. Yeah. And she knows that it's not good. (laughs) She knows that it's unhealthy, but she's caught in this situation where she wants to believe that he can be better. She sees the good things from him and so forgives the bad. And that's why they break up in the end, kind of. Like, why she's happy for them to have broken up in the end. Yeah. But it's very difficult to get yourself out of that situation still. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Oh. Finn. So. Finn. Yes. Okay. That was something that I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that was just... That was... I think Vic can be put down to the time to an extent. Like, he should have done better. But I think part of it is down to the time. I think that, yeah, reading that is just like, no. Even 2012, (laughs) no. Yeah. Nah. Because, again, it's... I forgive the characters. This is where it's really difficult. I forgive the characters... I don't know that I forgive the author. Yeah, I think that my issue with the chapter is if A had woken up in the body of somebody um, who was obese and they described, you know, the difficulty of being in a body that's quite unfamiliar to them and the struggles with, I don't know, like the struggles that come with that. Yeah, which does get touched on very briefly. Yeah, I think the issue was with descriptions like they'd gotten themselves into this mess because they were lazy and it was like, oh, come yeah. on now, oh, God, yeah, that you point. know? Um, yeah. Like, there's no need to pile on to this, you know, to yeah. not to not just, like, touch upon it briefly in one chapter and also to represent it as a struggle rather than being overweight is a completely normal thing that I think people villainize a lot but also yeah you know I think it was the actively making it a perspective of this person is fat and lazy and whatever was just a touch that I was just like this is not only harmful but it's also unnecessary in the chapter you know like this doesn't add anything to it well, I think it's just adding to the awkwardness of A's and Rhiannon's situation at that point, isn't it? Yeah. But I think this, again, comes back to the problems with doing a different perspective each chapter. Or not each chapter necessarily, but doing so many different perspectives. There are some that are done really well, some that are done pretty well, some that have their faults, and then I think this is really the one... <laughs> Where it's just, there's no good representation here. If you're talking about representing plus-sized people, you don't get any good representation in this chapter. No. You get the slightest bit of everything is harder. But like you say, there's no sympathy there. Yeah. And there's no understanding that there is a reason that he's in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there are people who are overweight because they're lazy and because, like, that is the main cause. I'm sure that those people exist. However, when the narrative is so often that everyone who's overweight is just lazy, the representation that you should be giving is not that the one overweight character or the one obese character, certainly, is lazy. Yeah. You're not adding anything there. You're not challenging anything. You're adding to the... Harmful stereotype. Yeah, the stereotype to the prejudice. And that's disappointing. Yeah. Because, like you say, he could have been overweight and we could have explored the fact that maybe obesity runs in the family. Maybe it's a mental health thing. Maybe he's on medication any of these things yeah. could have been explored with an obese character and allowed us or allowed the reader to be like, oh, okay, not everyone who's obese is just lazy, but instead we get another narrative playing into that. Yeah. When so many other things do challenge the general preconceptions, it's, it is very disappointing. Yeah. And it would have been... I'd quite like to have seen an overweight person represented who's just perfectly comfortable in their body you know who I think that like this whole sense of like awkward and sweating and it's like why like I'd enjoy to read from a perspective of somebody who's not looking to lose weight who's just overweight and comfortable you know yeah I I think anything other than what you get (laughs) (laughs) yeah anything which gave a different perspective even slightly yeah would have been enough 
yeah for it to just be like a passable chapter yeah (laughs) i think in a way finn and vic both fall into that same category of they're put at a place in the narrative where their differences can't be explored and so are just used as obstacles yes which is just unfortunate So I wrote down in my plan two topics to talk about. And the first one was representation in fiction, which is what we've been talking about this whole time, which I figured might be a a fairly big topic, but we've spoken about it for quite a while. Yes. (laughs) The second one in Venice is is a smaller topic, so we'll maybe just touch on it briefly. Mm -hmm. The heading I've got down on my paper is reading as a writer which is something that when you study creative writing at university, you hear that phrase a lot. Yeah. What I mean in this instance is reading something. And to my perspective, at least with this book, it was a case of reading something and the language just being crafted in such a way that I have no idea how he does it to me the way that david levithan writes certainly very much when i was a teenager still to an extent now it just got me it just gets me in a way that i can't express i can't explain how the writing is so good Mm. i just feel that it is and so it's a difficult thing to talk about on a podcast (laughs) but do you have like favourite quotes or anything like that? Um, I think this is the thing that's difficult. It's why it's difficult to talk about as well, in that it doesn't even necessarily come down to specific quotes. I had meant to get some examples up, but I ran out of time in the week, unfortunately, to come up with anything specifically. Because, like, my favourite quotes, you have, like, desire is desire, love is love. Great quote. I love that quote. But that's not a great quote for the language. I'm just going to flick through very quickly to see if I can find anything that's just, I think just, I think it's just the lyricism of the language a lot of the time, the way that the language flows and is so evocative. Mm. I'm trying to find a, uh, a section, but I'm struggling now. I've I've read a lot of bad writing. Right. Especially ones aimed at teenagers. I think that there's this like there's less of a standard when it comes to writing for teenagers. It's like, oh, that'll do. You know? And I do think that it was written the word that comes to mind is effortlessly. Like, yeah, it feels that way. It flows in a way that I didn't necessarily notice the language in the sense that, you know, when I read some books, I'm really become marvelled with the descriptions of things. But I will say that it it was just it just flowed. Yeah. In the way that writing should. Yeah. So I flicked through to try to find something, and I think I found something that's that encapsulates something of that feeling, and also something else that I love about this book, in the A often talks as an outsider of almost humanity looking in, mm. being able to see it from so many different perspectives, and kind of having these larger takes on the way that society works almost and the way that people work, that they gain from being able to see it from so many perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, this paragraph kind of encapsulates that a little bit, so I might just read it. Go for it. That's okay. So it's... They are in a church in the body of Roger Wilson. And so I'm just going to read the chapter. I've been to many religious services over the years, Each one I go to only reinforces my general impression that religions have much, much more in common than they like to admit. The beliefs are almost always the same, it's just that the histories are different. 
Everybody wants to believe in a higher power. Everybody wants to belong to something bigger than themselves, and everybody wants company in doing that. They want there to be a force of good on Earth, and they want an incentive to be a part of that force. They want to be able to prove their belief and their belonging through rituals and devotion. They want to touch the enormity. So then he goes on and talks about it a lot more. That's very eloquently put. Yeah, ex- I think that's the way to... That's what I love about it. And you get that not once in this book. Like, I managed to flick for about 10 seconds, 15 seconds and find that. Yeah. It's throughout. It's in a lot of David Leverton's writing. And it's something that I love about his writing. These moments of eloquence of... I think it's also a thing that is probably very personal, but a lot of the things that he's writing also ring very true for me, and to hear them or to read them so eloquently put is just... I don't want to say transcendent, but because tran- transcendent sounds cheesy, but that sort of feeling. Yeah. yeah. I get you. Yeah. I've had that with books. I... I didn't have that so much with this book, but I think that's because, similar to our discussion about soulmates, part of that feeling is things being able to touch you at a certain time and a certain place in your life. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the feelings that's explored in YA is something that is why it's important to read it as a teenager. Yes, I think this does that really well. Yeah. for a teenage audience yeah that you are exploring these thoughts and ideas as a teenager and that to read about them as a teenager hits you in a certain way that yeah. reading about it as an adult when you've had years to form your own thoughts about it yeah. doesn't quite hit you in the same way does that make sense yeah So we kind of talked about this earlier, touched on it a little bit. I've kind of actually touched on it throughout, really. But as a overview of it, then, how do we think it holds up? I think that it holds up decently. Yeah. But that give it another five mm. years and it probably won't. Yeah. yeah Does that, that make is sense? the worry a little bit. Yeah, I think it is one of those things where those things will only get more glaring, the things that we've talked about. Yeah. Feeling dated and feeling like not great representation will only get more and more glaring, unfortunately. Yeah. I also think, and this is something we haven't really discussed, but I think that Rhiannon as a female character is somebody who almost has to be saved. She's like, that's the thing is that A immediately comes across her and is like, this girl is really sad and I want to save her from her relationship. And that's something that was very popular in YA books at the time, which is why I I kind of forgave it because that was just that genre, you know, especially when we were late teenagers. Yeah. Um, But I think that... As plots and as we begin to shift, it's going to be a plot device that's not... You know, it's 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 always one of those things where you know in the future that the things that you've liked in the past are going to be seen as problematic. Yeah. And you're simultaneously like, that's a good thing because that means that things are progressing. Yeah. And it's also a sad thing because it means that the things that you would have enjoyed as a teenager are now seen as problematic. Yeah. And, you know, I think that overall, if I had read this in 2012, it would have probably blown my mind. Right. You know, yeah. in terms of representation and i don't think i was reading any books at the time that would have been as diverse yeah um as this one yeah and so in that regard i think it does hold up well yeah however probably by the standards of ya books that are coming out today and that will be coming out in the near future it probably like you say the issues that it does have will 
only become more sharp. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say against that is that I think Finn's chapter, which you pointed out, is the only thing that feels like truly bad representation. Yeah. I think anything else that is problematic in the book was well-intentioned for the most part, with maybe the exception of some of the Vic stuff. I think the Vic stuff could really hurt, especially when you look at it as queer literature. Yeah. But that said, I think something that we haven't really talked about either as just being brilliant is the concept. I think it's just a brilliant concept and the way it allows us to have so many different perspectives is brilliant. I think that while you weren't such a fan of the end, I think that the end is very sweet, at least. I think it wraps up as well as it can in terms of A's and Rhiannon's story. Although there is obviously a follow-up book. But no spoilers on that one. (laughs) Because who knows, you might read it. I would recommend reading Another Day, though. If you are going to read any more, I'd read Another Day. Because I think that definitely does add to Rhiannon's character and it definitely does flesh her out a bit. Well, a lot, really. And I think that is something that I want to say, actually, I forgot about for a second, is I definitely agree with you that there is this unfortunate tinge of A saving Rhiannon. And I think that's coupled with the fact that in a lot of ways this also reads like a straight romance. Yeah. And so it reads, rightly or wrongly, well, wrongly, in fact, but it reads as the guy saving the girl. Even though A isn't a guy, it still reads that way. Yeah. I think it's because to weirdly... I don't know. This is the first time I'm forming this thought. Sure. But my initial thought to that is I think that one of the reasons it feels like a straight romance is because Rhiannon sees it as a straight romance. Yeah. Because Rhiannon sees A as a guy who sometimes is a girl. Yeah. Rather than somebody who is gender fluid. Yeah. So therefore, Rhiannon's reactions to the romance, so like 50% of the romance see this as a straight relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I think, again, this is something that I think would be more explored if it were written nowadays. And I think it would be really interesting to explore that Mm. because, again, I'll disclaim, I'll just keep disclaiming because it's important. I'm cisgendered. But I do know that that's a thing that fluid or non-binary or non-conforming people do struggle with is romantic partners seeing them as either male or female and viewing them that way and therefore not viewing them as they truly are. And I think that would be something that would be really interesting for this to explore. Yeah. But in fairness, there's only so much you can fit in one book. (laughs) And still have a cohesive through line narrative, which I think is something that's brilliant about this book. Yeah. That we are able to see so many perspectives, and yet in terms of the main story, we do just have a fairly simple, straight narrative. Yeah. I think I think I could summarise it by saying that the that the plot device is a double-edged sword. Yes. In the sense of the benefit to it is that you get to see all of these different perspectives. And the downside of it is that because you see all of these different perspectives, none of them are particularly um, given the depth that perhaps other books are able to give them. Yes, I would challenge that slightly. I'd say that some of them are dealt with very well, but some of them are dealt with not very well. Yeah. So, how would you rate it? I don't know. How would you rate it? I think I'm giving it a nine. I think I've got to give it a nine. This is one of those things which is maybe not in the spirit of what we're doing here, but also kind of in the spirit of what we're doing here, is that I can't disconnect my nostalgia from it. Yeah. 
there is still that feeling of how important this book was to me yeah. when I first read it and how again it's cliche but like how a book can make you feel seen and like I said with the Hugo and Austin chapter it's like wish fulfillment literature as well as a closeted probably possibly when I read this as well I may have still been in the closet like god yeah so I can't separate that entirely and generally I still think it's overall great representation and a brilliant concept so yeah nine nice um I don't know this is that difficulty. If, this is why I'm not a huge person on rating things. Sure. Because, you know, anything above a seven feels like I'm giving it an excellent rating, but anything six or below feels like I absolutely hated it. Um, <laughs> eh, I don't know. Can I give it a 6.5? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Yeah, we've said this before as well. Anything below a seven to me is like not great, which I know that that's not how you see it, but then you're rating it below a seven, which to me is like, oh, it's not uh. <laughs> 7.5 at least. But no, if 6.5 for you, that's fair. That's fair. It didn't, it didn't click. Yeah, well written, had some interesting concepts, thought that, like I said, if I had read this in 2012 and it had so much diversity, yeah. it would have below my you know white girl teenage mind yeah like but didn't quite the emotional strings just like didn't hit me because yeah. i'm at a different point in my life yeah it's the nostalgia that i have that you don't that does make yes. a difference yes exactly yeah and i think that without nostalgia i don't know um can i say if there's any teenagers listening read it yeah go for it well, that was me saying it, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, if there are any teenagers listening, read it. Because we're out of touch 20-somethings now. And I'm sure in a lot of ways it will feel outdated, but in a lot of other ways, it is really great to see a lot of different perspectives in one book. Yes. So, what's next? What's next? Well, we've done films, we've done books, so we're going on to music. Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And so up next will be back to you, Georgia. So do you want to tell us what's next? 1989 by Taylor Swift. Indeed it is. <laughs> so uh, have fun, everyone. It's, uh... I don't know why I said have fun, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fun album. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's going to be you a good one. I... And, and you just, this one, like, we've made people, well, I'm assuming that anyone's going to be going along with this or, like, consuming these things for the first time because of our podcast. But people have had to watch stuff for a couple of hours. People have had to read things. And now they can just put Taylor Swift on in the background. Listen to the the one with the bonus tracks. Listen yeah, to the we're, deluxe we're talking, version. Yeah, we're talking deluxe version here. Yeah. I don't know what's on the basic version and what's not. We'll maybe talk about that. Yeah. But that's a... I was going to say that's a topic for next podcast, but that's the topic for next podcast. Mm-hmm. So... See you then. See you then. Hey. Ooh. Thank you for listening. The music at the beginning and end of the podcast is Cheer Up by Keys of Moon and the additional effects are from zapsback.com. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so at our website, nostalgiasperspective.co.uk, email us at nostalgiasperspective at gmail.com, or if you're listening on YouTube, leave us a comment down below. From next week, we'll be recording the credits at the same time as the podcast, so this should be the last time it feels so tacked on. And uh, yeah, join us then. Bye.